This is a brick. Inside it is another brick. You may say that bricks are boring and ugly, but you see, being a brick is a good thing, because this is a brick in a world of aluminum cans. Today I'd like to tell you a story of an immortal car, the Volvo 200 series, and its indestructible heart, the Volvo Red Block engine. Along the way, we'll dive back into the history of Volvo and Volvo cars of the 70s and 80s. We'll analyze their hardware and learn about the incredible legacy of these simple yet truly amazing machines. Our story starts way back in 1961, when Volvo introduced this, the B18 engine, created as a successor to the B16 engine, an engine that had already made its reputation as being very reliable and strong. But Volvo said, nay, this is not enough, or that had ar inte and they took an already strong engine and decided to make it even stronger. The B18 is important for Volvo because it marks a transition from a crankshaft with three main bearings to a crankshaft with five main bearings. But Volvo did not stop at that. In fact, they made the bearings absolutely giant. Their size is very similar to those on a truck engine. Volvo loved to boast back in the day how they're larger than those on a Ferrari V12, an engine subject to much higher stresses and loads. Now, the B18 camshaft is driven neither by a belt nor a chain. Instead, it's driven by gears, one of which was made from fibers to reduce operation noise. Now, gears were chosen instead of belts or chains because unlike belts or chains, gears can neither snap nor stretch. Now, the block was made from cast iron, and to ensure that the head and the block expand at an equal rate as the engine heats up, the head was also made from cast iron. And not just any iron, this was Swedish iron, regarded since ancient times as the best iron in the world. By the way, speaking of iron, do you know what the Volvo logo actually means? M -m Macho man! No. Uh, this is actually the ancient symbol for iron. By the way, this is copper. Uh, Iron ore quality and excellence in steel production has been a source of pride for Sweden since as far back as the 13th century, and the Volvo brand reflects this. Basically, the B18 is the engine equivalent of a bank vault. They say that a Volvo owner once accidentally dropped his Nokia 3310 phone on the B18 engine, and the phone got damaged. What I'm trying to say is that the engine was built to withstand pretty much anything. But interestingly enough, Volvo asked of it to withstand pretty much nothing. In its initial single carburetor version, the engine only made 75 horsepower. Back in the day, Road and Track called it the most understressed engine we have seen in many years. You see, all of this was happening back in a time where we didn't have CAD or computer simulations or generative design or artificial intelligence. The engineer of the 60s was equipped with a ruler, a pen, and some paper. This means that manufacturers didn't have the tools that allowed them to easily see after exactly how many hours or usage cycles something would fail. This means that the only way to make sure something lasts the required amount of time was to overbuild and overengineer. Now, many manufacturers back in the day would overbuild things to make sure they lasted, but Volvo was a bit different. They wanted to make really sure something lasted. After designing and building the B18, for some reason Volvo didn't trust its absolutely monolithic design. So they decided to verify that the engine would actually last. And the only way to verify is to do tests. So they took a bunch of B18 engines and ran them continuously for 500 hours at full throttle and full load. That's the equivalent of going non-stop around the equator twice, doing 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour at full throttle. None of the engines failed the test. But still, still Volvo wasn't sure that they would last. So they took the engines, installed them in some cars, took drivers, took engineers, put them in the cars, and drove them everywhere. England, Germany, Sweden, all kinds of roads, all kinds of conditions. Thousands of hours of wear tests were logged, and 620,000 miles were covered. None of the engines failed the test. 
Finally, engineers decided to somehow try and damage these things by pushing them well beyond the recommended red line. Surprisingly, the bulky and heavy internals of the B-18 could reliably sustain 7,800 RPM before signs of damage would occur. Finally, finally Volvo was reassured and they decided to mass produce the engines and install them in some Volvo cars, the P1800 perhaps being the most famous of them all. Also, they put the same engines in a bunch of amphibious and military vehicles. Of course, they did just fine. In fact, some say that the engines outlasted the military vehicles. When we take all this into account, there's no surprise that a P-1800 with a B-18 engine driven by retired science teacher Irv Gordon is the Guinness World Record holder for highest certified mileage driven by an original owner in non-commercial service. The mileage, two and a half million miles at the time of the record. Today, the car has 3.25 million miles and it's still being driven. Uh, Irv actually rebuilt the engine out of precaution because it was getting noisy at 680,000 miles, but once the engine was opened up, it was observed that a rebuild was not necessary. Uh, Irv bought the car in 1966 at the age of 26. Irv passed on, unfortunately, in 2018 at the age of 77. The car actually outlived him, and it's still being driven and kept alive today thanks to Irv's mechanic, Nino Gambino. Imagine how good a Swedish car has to be for an Italian mechanic to like it. Now, this approach to dedication and indestructibility that Volvo had set up during their experience with the B18 engine would define the brand in the next two and a half decades. Now, a big step forward was made in 1966 with the introduction of the 100 series. And then in 1975 came the real deal, the 200 series. And for the 200 series, Volvo introduced a brand new engine, the red block engine. Now there's a bit of confusion as to what constitutes a red block engine and if you ask a Volvo enthusiast they will tell you that if it's a Volvo, if it's rear wheel drive and if it's gasoline in line 4 then it's a red block. Now the previous engines the B18 and B20 usually aren't considered red blocks even though they meet all of these criteria and have red blocks. So basically red blocks are the engines that started with the 200 series. The first engine with a red block to be considered a red block is the B21 engine. And the B21 marks a giant leap forward in terms of technology. Gone is the cam and block and the push rods and replaced with a single overhead camshaft. The gears were replaced with a belt and the head was now aluminum instead of iron. But make no mistake, progress did not equal weakness, at least not with Volvo of the past, because the rods and the crank were still forged and very strong. The block was still a big, heavy chunk of Swedish iron, and everything else was still made with a big, fat margin for safety. So this was still a tank, but unlike the engines that came before, it was also being given the firepower to prove it. This car is a big deal, because with the 200 series, Volvo finally started realizing that indestructibility must equal potential. The previous engines, B18 and B20, were indestructible, but they were very understressed. In other words, they were doing pretty much nothing with their indestructibility. But with the 200 series and the red block, Volvo started stepping out of their OCD comfort zone and finally doing something with their indestructibility. So bit by bit, camshafts started getting a bit more aggressive. Fuel injection came into play. And then something beautiful, turbos. <laughs> In 1983, we received what can be considered the pinnacle of the red box, the B23 turbo engine granted to the 700 series. You see, a turbocharger helps an engine make more power, but it also stresses the engine more. So to ensure that its turbo engine can cope with the stress, Volvo made it extra strong, even though their naturally aspirated versions were already more than strong enough to cope with a turbocharger. So the B23 turbo engine received forged pistons in addition to forged rods and a forged crank. And then the rods were made extra thick 
you know, just to make sure that it lasts. But the 200 series wasn't left out. It received almost the same engine, only downsized to 2.1 liters. It made 155 horsepower and could propel the car from 0 to 60 in 9 seconds. This doesn't sound like much by today's standards, but back in the day it meant that the car driven by your math teacher was now just as fast as the local Rednecks Z28 or the Preppy Boys 944, all while being more reliable, more practical and a lot more discreet. But numbers alone couldn't convince the public that Volvos had performance potential. They were still perceived as boring, sensible, safe cars for boring, sensible, safe people. So Volvo decided to change everyone's mind. They took the 240 and cranked up the boost until the Red Block made 300 horsepower. The Red Block engine actually felt nothing and thus the flying brick was born. And then in 1985, a car with the aerodynamics of a wall showed up at the racetrack and won both the European and the German Touring Car Championship, you know, DTM, the Touring Car Championship. Along the way, Volvo patented a system to inject water into the intake manifold to reduce chances of knock, just like water meth injection that you see on race cars today. The flying brick then proceeded on to win podiums and take uh, first places in rally events and racing events all around the world, anywhere from from Scotland and Portugal all the way to New Zealand. After almost 20 years in production, the era of the 200 series ended in 1993. By that time, Volvo had made and sold 2.8 million units worldwide, most of which are still probably on the road being driven on their original drivetrains with hundreds of thousands of miles on the clock. The 200 series was so good that it outlived the car which was designed to replace it, the 700 series. It may not be flashy or turn heads, but it is perhaps given to its owners more than any other car. Simplicity, ease of maintenance, reliability, practicality, and comfort. And of course, let's not forget safety, because Volvo extended its strive for indestructibility to benefit its owners and passengers. The large frontal crumple zones incorporated into the 240 would pioneer the way towards passive safety in the automotive industry. In fact, in 1976, the US Highway Safety Administration purchased 24 Volvos 240 to serve as the safety ideal for any future car to be sold in the US. Basically, if a manufacturer would come to the Highway Safety Administration and ask them, what should we do to make our cars safer? They would point at the Volvo and say, just do whatever these guys did. And for the next 10 years, the Volvo 200 series would remain the safest car in the US, with the lowest death rate of any vehicle. And maybe this is a bit due to the fact that math teachers drive Volvos and, you know, their drive kind of so, but never mind, you get the idea. The car was very well made and it was very safe. Now, the legacy of the 200 series and the Red Block engine lives on and is safeguarded by a group of individuals that you definitely would not associate with Volvos back in the 70s and 80s. Young car enthusiasts looking for speed and thrills. Now, Volvo made these cars and engines into millions, which means that they, even today they are still pretty plentiful, you know, easy to find, relatively affordable. Uh, the engines were made strong, which means that they can take a lot of boost and abuse. The cars are rear wheel drive, aka right wheel drive, if you want to have some fun. Now, when you combine all of that with the fact that today turbochargers are no longer OEM only expensive space age technology like they were back in the 80s, today they're in fact pretty affordable and plentiful. And also what's plentiful is enthusiast level engine control and management electronics. So when you combine that which we have available today with, with that which was made well in the past, you have everything that a car enthusiast could ask for. And there you have it, a car and an engine which were built to last and left a lasting impact, not just on the global automotive industry, but in the hearts of owners and enthusiasts around the world. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.